Well, in the last few weeks, finishing up the Sermon on the Mount and progressing through chapter 8, we've seen both the characteristics and the cost of what it means to be a kingdom citizen. If you think about the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, talking about this is what kingdom life looks like. This is what it means to be a kingdom citizen. Not some time in the future in the millennial kingdom, but a kingdom citizen in the here and now. And then segueing into chapter 8, you understand the costs of what it means to be a kingdom citizen. I think it has had such a great impact on our understanding of basically what it means to live like and follow Christ. To live like a Christian and follow Him as we progress through this world. But I didn't want to progress too quickly past this because I think it's important for us to fully understand. As I've been preaching the last five or six weeks, I see a lot of nods. People are getting it. We're understanding. Uh, We're having a clear picture of what it means to follow Christ. That it's a narrow gate that leads to a narrow path. That this side of heaven, we are going to be ostracized in some sense. It's going to cost us relationally. It's going to cost us materially. Salvation is free, but discipleship costs perhaps even our life. But we've seen it principally. We've seen a little bit of an example as Christ has authority over diseases and expands the kingdom to the outcast, the unclean and the undervalued. But I think we needed to see more. And so I'm going to take a few weeks And we're going to dip back into the book of Acts. If you'll remember, we spent a year and a half in the book of Acts three years ago. And if there are principles in the Gospels, we see it lived out in living color, as it were, in the book of Acts. The book of Acts illustrates in the lives of real people doing life together as a church what it means to be a kingdom citizen. We see both what it looks like as a kingdom citizen and what it will cost as a kingdom citizen. If you look at the title of our sermon, it is Embassy Life for a Kingdom Citizen. And I've taken this concept from Jonathan Lehman's little blue book, the Nine Marks book, on membership. Let me read this concept to you in his own words. Quote, Where am I getting the idea of an embassy? Well, I'm getting it from the biblical idea of Christ's kingdom. A church is not the kingdom. It's an outpost, an embassy of that kingdom. What is an embassy? Well, it's an institution. It's an institution that represents one nation inside another nation. It declares its home nation's interests to the host nation. And it protects the citizens of the home nation living in the host nation. Let me read that second part to you one more time. What is an embassy? Well, it's an institution that represents one nation inside another nation. So like the U.S. Embassy inside the United Kingdom. It declares its home nation's interests. That United States Embassy inside the United Kingdom is doing its best to promote the interests Not of the UK, not of England or Scotland or Ireland or Wales, but of the United States. And to protect those citizens of the home nation. He continues on. So an embassy represents one place in another place of the globe. Now watch this. But what if I told you there was another kind of embassy? One that represents a place from the future. That is what the local church is. It represents a whole group of people under Christ's Lordship who will gather at the end of history. And it represents them in the here and now. And the host nation is the world. So this begs the question, what does it look like? What does it look like in the life of someone who has bowed the knee to the Lordship of King Jesus? What does it look like for someone who has had a transfer of allegiance from being a citizen of this world to being a citizen of the heavenly kingdom? 
what does it look like in the here and now? That's what Christ has been talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. But that's what I think we need to chew on a little bit. I need to see it in action. I need to see it in the lives of people. And I think the Holy Spirit realized that. And I think that's why Dr. Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gave us the book of Acts. You see, after writing about it in his Gospel, he continues to write about it as the fledgling church grows. I think Acts 2 gives us the clearest picture of what it looks like. And I think Acts 4, which we'll cover next week, gives us the clearest picture, or one of the clearer pictures, of what it looks like in terms of cost. So if this week is, here's what it looks like to be a kingdom citizen in real life as we do life together as a church, next week we're going to look at what it costs a kingdom citizen. And I think it's going to set us up really well for Good Friday and Easter. Because then when we look at the the crucifixion and resurrection, when we look at the atonement and then the satisfaction of God saying, paid in full, I think it's going to be hard for us to keep our mouths shut with our neighbors and family and friends as we invite them to come do life with us. As we invite them in to the kingdom to bow the knee to Jesus Christ, to repent of their sins and place their faith and trust in Him. Because all we're going to be doing as we witness to them is telling our story. This is what Christ has done for us. And here's what it will look like as we do life together and head towards that heavenly kingdom. Would you pray with me and we'll look at this text together? Gracious Father, we ask that You would bless our time this morning. We ask that You would calm our hearts, clear our minds, set aside the worries of the world, and focus on this divinely inspired Scripture. Scripture, the tool by which the third person of the Trinity dispenses faith. And for us as believers, we have faith, but we ask that You would strengthen it Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. We've committed ourselves to follow Christ. We are citizens of the kingdom and yet we are desperately dependent upon Jesus for our daily strength. Thank You, Lord, for being so gracious to give us illustrations. The book of Acts is a sermon illustration. Show us what it's like to do kingdom life together. Let us set aside our baggage from the churches we've been to, to the experiences we've had, to the books that we've read, and let us come together and sit at the feet of the Holy Spirit as He teaches us. Father, if we see things today here that we need to confess our sins for, I pray that we would readily do it if we realize that we've perhaps been going through the motions and that our heart hasn't been in doing kingdom life together, may we bow the knee in repentance. But then, Lord, may we get up. May we seek to please You in all that we do. May we seek to be used by You. And may the world know that we are truly citizens of the kingdom. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Dr. David Wells writes, quote, in the last two or three decades, evangelicals have discovered culture. Quote, they want to know about the trends and the fashions that are ruffling the surface of contemporary life. He progresses on to say, what, specifically, what determines how a church thinks, what it wants, and how it is going to do its business. Will it be sola scriptura or will it be sola cultura? Is it going to go to the Bible to say, this is how we live together? Or to put it another way, this is how a church grows Or will it seek wisdom from the world, as Chris talked about this morning? 
Will we be like the church in Corinth? Or will we be like the church Christ designed? You know, in the last 25 years, there's been a a huge resurgence of how to do church. Specifically, a whole movement on church growth. If you go to any of the bigger bookstores, there's a large section. And continually we see publication after publication on, no, 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 this is the best way to grow your church. How to grow a church quickly. How to grow it this way. How to be culturally relevant. It was all started about 25 years ago with a man named Bill Hybels in Willow Creek Community Church out of Chicago. He set this movement called the seeker-sensitive movement into motion. And he awakened a need where people had to, to start thinking about the way they did church. In a nutshell, they said this is our philosophy. Quote, participation is a big deal. We believe that the more people participating in areas of set activities with higher levels of frequency will produce disciples of Christ. And they built a very large ministry on it. So you can understand their shock just a few years ago when their own research suggested the contrary. Quote, Increasing levels of participation in these sets of activities does not predict whether someone is becoming more of a disciple of Christ. It does not predict whether they love God more or love people more. Some of the stuff that we've put millions of dollars into thinking it would really help our people grow and develop spiritually, when the data actually came back, it wasn't helping people that much. Other things, things we didn't put a lot of money in, things we didn't put a lot of staff towards, well, that's the stuff people are crying out for. What had they discovered? The hard way they had discovered that the biblical model for church growth is actually in the Bible. And the biblical model for church growth is not some detailed systematic formula as much as it is living like who you are. Kingdom citizenry, living together, doing life together, on purpose, on mission. Let's be honest, this side of heaven, we're going to make a lot of mistakes. Though we are a new creation and old things have passed away, new things have come, nevertheless, we have the flesh to deal with. We're learning day by day as we study the Word of God more and walk in the Spirit. We're not going to do everything right. That's not the point. The point is, Christ will build His church And the gates of what? Hades will not prevail against it. And how does He do it? Well, He tells us. He tells us in the Gospels and He actually shows us in the book of Acts. Essentially, what Willow Creek was saying when this research came back is that focusing on the hard work of life-on-life discipleship Not event participation is actually what grows the church. It's actually what makes disciples. Being the church. Not doing church. Not going to church. But being the church. Well, that's what really produces disciples. That's what causes the church to grow. MacArthur echoes it well. If a church will focus on the depth, God will handle the breadth. Amen? What does the Bible really give us a clear picture of this? It does. And as I mentioned, it's in Acts 2. Rather than being a 25-year-old publication, it's a 2,000-year-old publication. Today, we're going to look at a response to Peter's sermon at Pentecost. I would encourage you to go back and start from the beginning this week as you have a a chance in your quiet time to look at Acts chapter 1 and the beginning of Acts chapter 2. What we're going to see today is the Word of God empowered by the Spirit of God transform the people of God. Look at verse 37. It kind of sets the stage. Peter's been preaching strong. says, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. 
and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? What had they heard? Simply put, they had heard the gospel. And what we see in verse 37 is a picture of the word doing its work in breaking through a stony heart and causing the scales to fall from their eyes in giving sight to the blind. And the Holy Spirit is effectually drawing them near, helping them see who they were and what they had done. Let's go back just a little bit and let, let's listen to this sermon so we might too revisit what it was like when we were pierced to the heart. Look back at verse 22. About the side note here, isn't it interesting? This is Peter preaching. The same fisherman who denied Christ three times. The same one who, who had to be told by Jesus, get behind me, Satan. The one who said, yeah, I, I want to follow you. I'll walk on the water and then start sinking. Mr. Open Mouth, Insert Foot, failure in faith over and over and over again, and that, and that he's being used by God so mightily here. Verse 22, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God, there it is again, but God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Look down at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made Him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. Whoo! Can't you just imagine some liberal reporter from Israeli News Network coming up to Peter afterwards and say, well, gee, uh, preacher, that wasn't very culturally relevant, was it? Waiting for his response. Twice at least in this sermon, you're accusing these people of what? Can we say it? Murder. You killed your king. There's no doubt or dispute that he was the Messiah, was attested to you by signs and miracles and wonders before God and men. And yet, you killed him. The title of Peter's sermon was literally, You Murdered Your Messiah. But frankly, whether we were there or not, we are the recipients of that message. Whether we actually nailed the nine-inch nails into his wrists or not, we would have done the same thing and we did through our sin. I could go around the room and I could ask each one of you to tell me about the day when you were pierced to the heart. When you understood the Gospel. When you understood that you were guilty before God. That you had sinned. And the paycheck that you had rightly earned for that sin was death. And then understanding the great exchange that the Prince of Heaven who had never sinned took your penalty on the cross. And in exchange, you received His life. I've heard your testimonies. You remember that moment where you understood, where you were downwind of yourself and you felt the real conviction, not the remorse, but that you were guilty. And then the good news of the Gospel, but God. But that God Himself was extending salvation because the Son had paid the price and all He asks us to do is to repent of our sins and follow Him. Peter says in verse 38, Repent! The good news, repent! And let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
So what does it look like as we embark upon this text? What does it look like when we submit to the king's authority, become kingdom citizens as it were, and embark upon this narrow road journey through this narrow gate and head towards home? What does it look like to do life together? Acts gives us a peek into this embassy life. Today I want to observe six characteristics of embassy life. I want us to be encouraged by it. I want us to be convicted by it. I want us to realize that how we do life will overflow in how this church grows. Both in depth and in breadth. So look at your outline, and if you don't have one, write down these words. Commitment. Community. Generosity. Number four, preaching and pastoring. Appreciation. And number six, evangelism. If you want to think in terms of kingdom life, These are six descriptions. Let's look at the first one together. Verse 41, commitment. So then, those who had received His Word and were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. If you're a teacher here, wouldn't you love to preach a sermon like Peter? Wouldn't you love to have that sort of response? I mean, he's laid it out there with boldness. You, you, you killed your Messiah. Let's pray. And if you want to be baptized, we're going to go down to the river afterwards. What sort of response do you think you would get? I mean, that's a pretty fat and heavy sermon. It's pretty offensive. 3,000 converts. 3,000 people got baptized. 3,000 people joined the church that day. Who's going to follow this guy in the pulpit next week? Not me. No way. But it's not because of Peter's sermon, is it? Is it? No. Peter blew it before. He's going to blow it again. It's how Christ builds His church. He chooses to use crooked sticks to strike straight licks. He uses Peter to preach a sermon that brings in 3,000. Do you realize that Stephen preached about the same sermon not too long after this? And they stoned him for it. Christ is building His church His way through His Word empowered by His Spirit. What's the first thing they do upon repenting of their sins and committing their life to Christ? Well, they get wet. They get baptized. We understand that, right? We're Baptistic. Baptism is identification and proclamation. And I think we understand that it is an outward sign of an inward change. That's what we've been taught. But it's more than that. You see, we, were no, we were, are no longer in Adam. Now we're in Christ. There's been a transfer. A transfer of allegiance. A change in nature. It's not only an outward sign of an inward change. It's an identification issue. Something has happened and now we're identifying with another person. With another country. With another group of people. You sports fans out there, you know that that you're going to be watching for the, the draft picks coming up. Who's going to be transferred? Who's going to sign with who? And a lot of times we don't know right off the bat There may have been a deal inked in private a month ago, but it's when they have the press conference and that athlete signs on the dotted line then, puts on the new jersey and the hat, and everyone takes the pictures. That's baptism, as it were. You may have gotten converted a month ago, but when you get baptized, you're saying, I'm a follower of Christ now, and by the way, I'm with them I'm with the Bride of Christ. John Calvin says it well, Baptism serves as our confession before men insomuch as it is a mark 
by which we openly declare that which we choose to be ranked among the people of God. That we're with them. But it's more than that. In, in our consumeristic culture, it, it can be offensive. We're now submitting to this group of people. We're saying, yes, we're saved for eternity, but we're going to do life together with them. And we're not a bunch of autonomous people, but we are a group of people bound together by the Holy Spirit who submit to the Word of God and His under-shepherds, and we hold each other accountable and we care for one another. It is a radical change. In this day and age, it is offensive in American Christendom. Lehman again. He doesn't just tell them to repent. He also tells them to be baptized. Talking about Peter. Peter is simply saying, tell the owner that you're done trying to be your own boss and that you want to play for him now. And then prove it by reporting to his coach, the church. I heard a guy say recently, I was talking on the phone with him. So what church do you go to? Well, I go to two churches. So I go here and here, but it's really it's just kind of you know, me and, and Jesus. He said, I'd love to have lunch with you and, and, and talk about missions and all this other stuff. And I said, I would love to do that as well. Um, are you also okay with me encouraging you to commit yourself to one local body of believers? He wasn't interested. We haven't had the lunch. But I had one chance. We could have talked about missions. We could have talked about preaching. We could have talked about writing books together. But if this fellow wasn't willing to submit himself to a local body of Christ, it's going to be pretty hard to invite others to do the same, right? And so they get baptized. This was a big deal. They had hung around since Passover. They were celebrating Pentecost. They now pledge their allegiance to the King who was crucified and rose again. And now they're saying, and we're with these people. We're going to leave it all behind. We're going to do life together as kingdom citizens. To put it simply, baptism was first century membership. These folks were going against their entire family, against their entire social network to get baptized as a Jew in the name of Jesus Christ was to be put out of your synagogue. It was in many cases to be rejected by your family. You are now saying that you are following an executed criminal. That's not only crazy, that's a cult. Have you ever had anyone say that you're a part of a cult? Family? Friends? Hey, I believe in Jesus too, but whoa, you take it way too seriously. You've got to realize, as a first century Jew, your whole community was wrapped up in the synagogue. That was your life. Those were your friends. Those were your neighbors. That's who you did business with. That day when many got baptized, they left everything behind. If you were a baker, no one's buying your bagels anymore. Okay? If you're a jeweler in the family business, you're now a day laborer. You were put out of the business. If you were a single woman, you're not marrying into the prominent family down the street anymore. You're an embarrassment. And don't forget, if you don't like the way things are going in your new family, in your new church, you don't just go down the street to another one. There is no other church. And later on, when there was another church, guess what that pastor did? He sent you home. You can't just leave because you don't like the, the, the worship pastor or that pushy deacon or, or the way things are done. This was your new community, warts and all. You see, because you were living in another country, and this embassy, well, that was just a little bit of soil of the kingdom of which you're now a part of. So there's a real commitment. Number two, let's look at community. These committed believers were doing life together. Verse 42, 
they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Acts 2.42 is one of my most favorite verses in the Bible. I love it because I read this and I think, this is church. And can I encourage us as a body of believers? I don't think this is church. This is how it should be. I praise the Lord because when I read Acts 2.42, this is what I think of. This is what we experience at Metro. Oh, surely not perfectly, but progressively. I've never experienced Acts 2.42 type church, fellowship, commitment, community, whatever you want to call it, except here. I'm so thankful for that. So as I preach this morning, hear me saying like Paul did, great job! Let's excel still more, right? Let's not rest on our laurels and think we got it perfect, or let's not wring our hands and say, gee, this is what I want. I wish I could find this. Let's say, hey, we've got a a good dose of this here. Let's just do it better. Look what it says there. It says they were continually devoting themselves. Being the church wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't something they squeezed in. It was their very life. Their identity was in Christ and His church. Your whole life was wrapped up here now, no longer in your synagogue. By the way, Sunday did not become a holiday until 321 A.D. under Constantine. So guess when you met for church? Well, it was either early Sunday morning or Sunday night after work. It was a work day. But look at the foundation of this community. Look at the very very first thing Dr. Luke, Luke hits on. Teaching. Teaching. What is the apostles teaching? They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Do you have a book in your Bible that says, here's the apostles' teaching? I, I don't have it in my concordance or in my outline here. What is the apostles' teaching? Is that, is that the tradition? The Catholic Church says, well, that's the tradition that we've just kept down through the years, the extra-biblical stuff. No. The apostles' teaching is what we now have in the New Testament. It's the epistles. If we have the sayings of Christ in the Gospel, which were handed down through oral tradition, right? The apostles' teaching is the apostles' teaching on what Christ said. Do you realize what we have here at Pentecost and afterwards in all the other churches is the apostles' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount and his other sermons and his other sayings. But he's taking these seeds in the Sermon on the Mount and he's saying, and this is what it looks like. And this is what he means. And here's some wonderful examples. Isn't that interesting? And so as we jump over here, what we get to see is they were sitting under the apostles' teaching And the apostles were teaching them about the Sermon on the Mount. And yet, I'm not sure we value it like the New Testament church did. You know, they didn't have a copy of the Word of God. They may have had a copy of the Hebrew Scriptures. It would have been expensive. They would have memorized it. They would have talked about it. But yet, if you're like me, sometimes you, you, you miss a day or two of quiet time. You miss your devotional and you think, well, it's not that big of a deal. We don't actually think it all the way through like, I don't need spiritual nourishment, right? We don't say that to ourselves. We say, I'm busy, I'll get to it tonight, and then, and then we get tired, right? But we wouldn't go a day without food, right? I wouldn't go a day without food. I need that physical nourishment. You wouldn't, you wouldn't not feed your baby. You wouldn't say, ah, yeah, she's missed a few meals, but hey, here's just a little apple juice. This will tide her over. It says they were continually. It's in the imperfect. It's, it's an ongoing process. They were feeding themselves with the Word of God. Peter, who would later write his epistles, talked about its importance. 
1 Peter 2, 2, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. We know what that's like, right? When you became a believer, were you hungry for the Word of God? Were you there every time the church doors were open? Did you long like newborn babes? Uh, I'm hungry. When's my next meal? Give me that food. In real practical terms, if teaching is one of the first things that is taught here, okay, as being important, one of the first things is being observed, the very conduit by which our faith is increased, we need to realize how important it is. It is the spiritual nourishment that we need. And we cannot get by one meal a week. This is not going to do it. This is going to tide you over until tomorrow morning. This church is going to grow at the level at which you self-feed. Do you realize that? You can't go without corporate worship, but neither can you go without self-feeding. If you want to grow, you've got to eat. And so the first thing we see here is they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the Word of God, and then also to fellowship. It's not just me and Jesus and my Bible over here. I don't need church. I'll just study on my own. I do have to study on my own, but then I also need to gather for fellowship. What's that word there? You've heard me say it before. Koinonia. Common. Fellowship. They spoke a common language. There was a commonality when they gathered together. Listen to verse 44. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. Jerry Bridges describes fellowship rightly. He says, fellowship, common, okay, is partnering with one another in their spiritual growth. That's done through our self-feeding. That's done through our corporate worship. That's talking about it. That's encouraging one another. That's gathering together and talking about how to apply it. So teaching, fellowship. What's the next one? Breaking of bread. This is primarily talking about the Lord's table, which for the first 250 years was done in conjunction with, watch this, a family meal. Do you know what that family meal was called? The love feast. Newman didn't make that up, <laughs> right? So when we have a love feast with our Good Friday service, it's primarily so we can gather together and do what the first century Christians did. Enjoy our fellowship, enjoy a meal together, and then enjoy the sacrament or the ordinance of the Lord's table. And even then, it started to cost them a little bit. Do you know what the scuttlebutt was about these Jewish Christians who were gathered together in secret, behind closed doors, and uh, spending time together? Do you know what they were accused of? cannibalism. Do you know why? The only thing people heard from the outside is, this is my body. Eat. This is my blood. Drink. And so rumors went out that these Christians, these people who are part of the way, were cannibalistic. And they took a bad a hit in their reputation for it. So let's look and see what we have so far. Are you with me? We have, we have a commitment, okay? We have the church baptizing people, committing themselves to one another, even in the face of relational rejection. We have the preaching of God's Word, and we have participation in the Lord's table. John Calvin would say, there you go. You got a church. If you have the right preaching of God's Word and the right administration of the sacraments or the ordinances, baptism, Lord's table, you have a church. You have a church. Look at the fourth one. Prayer. Literally, the prayers. An integral part of their corporate worship was they would gather together and they would pray. It's an area I think we need to grow in. We, we do pray. Ryan prays during the service. When someone reads Scripture, oftentimes they'll pray. I'll pray before the sermon. I'll pray after the sermon. Can I tell you an area of conviction I think we need to grow in a little bit? I think we need to have more of a prayer of confession, corporate confession. And then I think we need to have maybe more of a, a prayer uh, where, we, where we worship 
or prayers of petition. I think we need to elongate the time of prayer in our service. We're going to try to move towards that a little bit. If you don't join us at 8.30, please do so. It's a sweet time. Especially this morning, we prayed for the lost. We prayed for health. We prayed for, for you and our congregation that you might be bold in witnessing. We pray that we might endure hardship. That we might pursue holiness. That we might stay the course. Remember the overall theme in Acts. It's been a while since we've been there. Christ is building His church with His witnesses equipped with His Word empowered by His Spirit. So think about these ingredients so far here. Teaching, it's God's Word speaking to us, right? Fellowship, it's believers speaking God's Word to one another. Breaking a bread is believers having a communion meal remembering His Word. And then finally, prayer, it's believers responding to the Word of God. It is the Word of God that reverberates from the pulpit back and forth in the pew from His pages into your life and then back this way. You see, there's no concept of going to church. But there's a whole New Testament on being the church. So how are we doing here? Well, I mentioned prayer. I think we can improve on that. Um, there's other areas we can improve on as a church. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love for you to share it in small group. But we want you to share it with a willingness of helping us grow and being a part of it. Let me ask us a question that, that we can answer in our minds. How are you doing individually? In what areas do you find yourself Fearful of engaging more. Fearful of transparency. Maybe complacent when it comes to evangelism. What we see here with these 3,000 members of the Jerusalem Bible Church is they're all in. Look at verse 43. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. There's genuine excitement. And unlike what we, we heard in our opening illustration, it's not because there's ear tickling going on. There's not because we're inviting them to come partake of a, a consumeristic smorgasbord. No, the Jerusalem Bible Church is, if they had a, if they had a tagline, it would be, Jerusalem Bible Church, come worship with us, loving Him and loving others. Dot, dot, dot. It's not about you. Boy, you want to talk about offensive, but it's true. When you read these verses, 37 through 47, I mean, they are all about the one another's of Scripture. They're all about fulfilling the law. Christ says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. What does it mean to fulfill the law? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength continually devoting themselves to the apostles' apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, and love your neighbors yourself, to fellowship, and then to prayer. There's no grand scheme on church growth here. And yet there's an entire life, an entire body life, that is wholly devoted to Jesus Christ. Let's look at the overflow. Number three, it's going to go faster. We're going to get out of here 233, don't worry about it, okay? Generosity, number uh, verse 44. And all those who had believed were together, circle that, were together, okay? And had all things in common. Circle that, had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all and anyone who might have need. They were together. They had things in common. They were sharing they were sharing themselves, okay? And they were sharing their stuff. You can't just share your stuff and not share yourself. You can't just share yourself and not your stuff. They were doing both. They were giving of their time, talent, and treasure. 
Now, if you're like me, you look at this and you're like, okay, have I missed something? Is this the red letter text for socialism here? No, it's not. Peter makes it clear that none of this was done under compulsion. Three chapters later, he makes it really, really clear. It doesn't mean we sell and give everything away. It does mean there needs to be a willingness to meet the needs of those in the body. To give in such a way that you realize that you don't own it, you're merely a steward of it. That said, what they're giving here is not their leftovers. They're not doing a, you know, I don't need these old shoes anymore. Maybe Joe, he doesn't have anything. I'll give them to him. No, you get the sense they're giving of their best. They're not scrambling around, you know, at church. Honey, you got a 20 on you to throw in the plate? No, they're, they're giving of their best. They're giving of their first fruits. 1 John 3.17, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Again, this is not formulaic. This is former pagans, now citizens of the kingdom, who are all in and following Christ and in doing life together and using whatever God's given them to further the advancement of His kingdom. And you can imagine how crucial this was. 3,000 people who have had a life change. These people were from all over the Roman Empire. You see, the Jews had experienced what was called the diaspora, the dispersion. That because in 605 through 586 BC, they had gone to Babylon and then Persia ruled, there's many who didn't go home. And so you had Jewish communities all over the Greek, the Persian, the Greek, and now the Roman Empire. We know that Apollos came from Alexandria. Well, that's a port city in Egypt. What's Apollos doing in Egypt? He's a Jew who is mighty in the Scriptures. Well, because his family had lived there for centuries. So there's Jews all over the Roman Empire that would come together for the Passover meal and they would hang around until Pentecost 50 days later. Well, what happens? They get saved and they realize, I can't go back to my former life. Many were like Matthew. Matthew. I'm sure there's many tax collectors here. Maybe they were in some Roman outpost way east of there. I can't go back and and fleece my, my friends and neighbors anymore. Much less fleece anyone. I can't go back to my former way of life. This is my new life. And so all they were left with was, in many cases, the clothes on their back. Maybe you were a butcher. Maybe you were a butcher that lived in Athens and though you were Jewish, you sold kosher meat to the Jewish community and you had been upcharging them to make a lot of money. You can't go back. This was your new family. For whatever reason, many stayed behind and they didn't have anything and so the saints in Jerusalem start to take care of their brothers and sisters in Christ. Can you see why the Jerusalem elders asked Paul to take up a collection for the saints in Jerusalem because they were so poor? Does it make sense? We don't realize that because we come from such affluence. But while we may not have material needs, what do we have in this body? Oh my goodness. Spiritual needs, emotional needs, relational needs. Needs that our pagan family and friends can't fulfill. We are family. We're getting a taste of what these people experienced. Look at number four, the fourth characteristic. I put them together, preaching and pastoring. Verse 46, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together. I want you to notice something here. Continuing with one mind in the temple, that's preaching. That's the gathering for corporate worship on Sunday. It's formal worship. And you say, well, where did they find a place, a sanctuary that you could seat 3,000 people? This is the world's first megachurch right here. Well, there was a place. We know from history that it was Solomon's colonnade. I think Scripture mentions it as well. It's at the Temple Mount. 
You say, well, how is that possible? Why would traditional Jews let converted Jews who are now Christians worship on the Temple Mount? What's going on on Sunday at the Temple Mount? Nothing. <laughs> All the activities took place on Saturday. They got the whole place to themselves on Sunday. And so if you see the old pictures of Solomon's colonnades, this massively long corridor with columns, and 3,000 people would gather and stand for the reading and preaching of God's Word. Isn't that amazing? And do you know how God had prepared this church to be good expositional listeners? Because remember I told you when the captivity came in 586 B.C., the temple was destroyed, and now they're over here in Babylon. And so they start to have synagogues. And synagogues became the place where you, where you couldn't go to the temple, you went to your synagogue for, watch this, the reading, the teaching, and the explanation of God's Word. Isn't that interesting? When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that He might redeem those under the law. All these things came together as Christ builds His church. And it says they are with one mind. True unity. Does that mean their theme was open minds, open hearts, open doors? What was their claim? This man whom you crucified is the Messiah. No, that's an exclusive claim to King Jesus. Their unity came through doctrinal fidelity. Doctrinal faithfulness. Ephesians 4.11 And He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. We know that verse, right? Do we know this part? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Meaning that we are unified. Our gifts serve one another, but we are unified through the doctrinal fidelity, the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. That means at Metro Bible Church, we stand upon the Word of God, whether it's popular or whether it's not. Whether all of evangelicalism punts this aspect of it and goes on to something else. We stand upon the Word of God, and it's what creates unity, fidelity. And they were not only gathering for corporate worship, but they were breaking bread from house to house. What do we have here? Sharing life together. Doing the one another's. Being pastored. Being cared for. Jim Boyce, the former pastor, he's now with the Lord of 10th Presbyterian Church, describes this Jerusalem Bible church and the necessity of shepherding. I think it's interesting. He says, quote, this was an inner city church. It was a large church, and it had a multiple staff ministry. It began with the 12 apostles. But when the 12 found that there were still not quite enough people to do the work, they asked the church to elect seven deacons. And so they had 19 officers at one time. Wow. Serving, ministering, shepherding this church. This is small groups here. Breaking bread from house to house. I'm not saying small groups are essential or thus saith the Lord, but I'm saying if I'm going to preach at you, it's only fair if I get to pastor you, right? And the best way that we make sure that no one falls through the cracks, the best way more so that we make sure that you are cared for on a weekly basis is small groups. Oh yeah, there's study and there's prayer and there's fellowship and those are important things, but primarily small groups are about pastoring. Doing kingdom life together in the embassy means that we gather for corporate worship. Thus saith the Lord. The main point of the text being the main point of the sermon delivered with an unction for change. And then we gather together to walk with one another through life. We pastor. Number five, appreciation. Look at the second part of verse 46 with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. You know, just simply put, they were joyful. 
They were just joyful people. They weren't a bunch of Eeyores. They weren't sad sacks. I'm sure they had greater problems than we do. It didn't make a difference whether they were extroverts or introverts. Christians are called to be joyful. Rejoice always, Paul says. And again I say rejoice. Philippians 1.3, Paul's writing from jail. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in every prayer for you all in view of your participation of the gospel in the Gospel from the first day until now. In view of our partnership in the Gospel, no matter how bad my circumstances are, I'm rejoicing because I'm a kingdom citizen. And we've partnered together and we're walking a narrow path towards home. Number six, evangelism. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Wow. Did I miss the church growth formula there? I didn't hear what book they read, what conference they went to, what flyers they sent out. I didn't even hear about an Easter egg hunt or anything, you know? It says they were doing life together. They were submitting to the Word of God. They were loving on one another, warts and all. And they were rejoicing. And the Lord was adding to their number. The Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who were being saved. You say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean... Well, Rod, it sounds like we don't have to do anything. We just do church, right? No, I think there's more there. That was adding is a continuous event. And it comes on the heel of their excitement. Their rejoicing. They can't keep quiet. They're, they're talking about it to everyone. They're sharing what's going on in their life. I was blind, but now I see. I was a butcher in Athens, and now this is my new home. Why? Are you a butcher here? No, I'm doing what I can to get by, but I'm part of the Jerusalem Bible Church. Would you, would you come join us? How about come to a small group tonight? Can I share with you? I thought this Jesus, this, this carpenter turned rabbi was a nut. You know what? He is the Messiah. He's what? He is? He was the Messiah. No, He is the Messiah. What do you mean by that? He rose from the dead. You've got to be kidding me. You really believe that? I do. I do believe that. Can I share with you why? Can we go to the Word of God? How about you come over tomorrow night and we'll have a meal together and we'll talk about it. You see, the family of Jesus Christ, this, this newly birthed organism, not organization, was sharing life together. And the way it grew was not through some sort of formula or some sort of book or program. It grew because they were inviting people into the family. They were inviting people to be kingdom citizens. It's, it's like at Christmas time when you have the, the one or two guys or gals that come who are not part of the family and they gather, gather together and just by osmosis, by the end of the meeting, they feel like they're part of the family. They're looking at the photo albums. They're hearing the stories of when grandpa came from Italy or, or when mom used to do this, putting you to sleep at night. And they get excited about it. And then you turn to them and you say, do you want to be part of the family as Christians? Do you want to repent of your sin and place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? And you take them to a crossroads. And we don't manipulate. We don't try to convince but we call them with an unction and then we watch the Holy Spirit do His work. And guess what? Some don't believe, but some are pierced to the heart. And say, what do I do? You say you turn from your sin, you bow the knee to King Jesus, and then you let the world know and you get baptized and do life together in the embassy. I think if we understood that that's what evangelism is, we wouldn't be nearly so fearful. 
I think if we realize that that's what we're called to do, it wouldn't scare us so bad at all. We've got to be honest with ourselves. This church is probably healthier than it's ever been. But this church and every church, if we don't evangelize, it's only a matter of time before we close our doors. You can only swap sheep for so long. If there's an area we need to grow, this is it. I look at these characteristics, it's like, man, we are, by God's grace, getting it, doing it. It's exciting. I know we need to grow in some areas. This is the area. We've got to start sharing the good news with others. We've got to start inviting them to come, to be with the family. And then we've got to call them to commit, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, to cross the line and become a kingdom citizen. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the Gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Are you witnessing once a week? It's not too much to ask as, as all the Lord's done for us. Are you witnessing once a week? Are you inviting your friends and your coworkers to church at least once a week? We need to be. But it needs to not be a burden. We need to do it out of obedience, but we really need to do it out of a delightful obedience. We need to be excited. We've got a lot to be excited about. We're going to heaven, right? We're going to heaven. I don't know how bad your situation is today. We're not guaranteed our next breath. But we are guaranteed eternal life because we've attached ourselves to the King. And man, if we can't tell others about that, I don't know what we can talk about. Let me recap all this. By the way, this is our theme next year for Ante Supalabra. I'm not ashamed of the Gospel. Isn't that exciting? Baptism, church membership, do not save. But converted people get baptized and join a church. And they do life together. After that commitment and community, they gather for worship, for teaching, for praying, for celebrating the Lord's Supper. They spend time outside a form of worship, feeding themselves with the Word of God, spending time discipling one another and making disciples and sharing their faith with the lost. If we will focus on that depth, God handles the breath. We may have to do it for a long period of time before we start to see a harvest. That's okay. There's not a one of us that's going to get to heaven and say, gee, I really wasted a lot of time telling other people about Jesus. They didn't believe. It's not... It's not our role to make them believe. It's just our role to, to sow the seed. And it is our role to invite them into the kingdom. I want to put myself on the chopping block here. I want you as a congregation to ask me weekly who I have invited to church. What relationships I've risked to share the Gospel. It's not that I want to do it out of compulsion, but I can't preach this stuff if I don't live it. I can't call all of us to run with me if I'm not setting the pace. And so if I know you're going to ask me, in that moment, when I have an opportunity to choose to witness or to be lazy, I might just choose to witness. And I know the more that I do it, and the more that I get used to it, the Lord's going to honor that at some point. He's going to save whom He will, who He will. But I want to be found faithful. Will you hold me accountable? Amen?